Hello, you're listening to What I Did Next from ANT Media. I'm Malak Fuad, your host. What I Did Next revolves around people's personal and professional crossroads and looks at those trajectories from key pivot points. My guests are multilingual, multicultural, with roots in the Middle East. They're engaged, curious, and passionate about knowledge and strive to make a difference in the world. Today I chat with Hassan El Demluji, Deputy Director of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's responsible for the foundation's geographic teams for the Middle East, Pakistan, and East Asia, and he advises Bill and Melinda Gates on their engagement in those countries. Hassan has been named as one of the 100 most influential Arabs under 40 every year since 2015 by Arabian Business Magazine. As well as working in the public health arena, Hassan is the author of The Responsible Globalist, a book that addresses the positive factors of international cooperation amongst nations. Hassan, who is half Irish and half Iraqi, grew up in the UK and only discovered the Middle East firsthand as a young university student. A chance trip to the region with his aunt at the age of 19 was the first major pivot for Hassan and is a catalyst for his next steps. The only person who spoke English was uh, my aunt, who I'd gone with. And everyone around us, including all of the people we spend all day with, you know, her friends, didn't speak a word of English. So it was really being plunged in the deep end in a country that, um, uh, you know, it was a real Arab country <laughs> in yeah. the sense that And it was very closed off. I mean, it's always been, it was always very closed off, Syria. That's what, yeah. Exactly. That's what I meant by a real Arab country. Not very cosmopolitan, in other words. Uh, yes, exactly. But I was fascinated. Uh, tell me a little about, so you, at that time, you were already in university. That's right. I was studying classics, so Latin, Greek, comparative linguistics, archaeology, uh, ancient philosophy, those sorts of things. Yeah. And then after your Syria trip? Yeah, after my Syria trip, I came back and I remember having a, a, a Latin tutorial uh, with uh, a man who, you know, it, it, this conversation was really important to me, but in general, he became a real mentor to me. And, he's, and I said to him, I've got to figure out a way of learning Arabic. But did you speak any Arabic at home, Hassan, with your father? Or was it completely new to you? You know, my dad said to us, we're British now. You're British. It's better for you to be British. You know, just forget the Middle East. Um, so other members of my family, including my aunt, who later became a politician in Iraq when, um, not much later, this is 2002, absolutely always an Iraqi, an Iraqi diaspora in the Iraqi community. My grandparents lived in Abu Dhabi, you know, continued to live in, in the Middle East and, were, you know, saw themselves as very Arab and Iraqi. So that was there, but not in the household, not not from my dad. Perhaps if your mother had been from the region, it would have been a different story. Or it's the other way around. If he hadn't been like that, he might have married someone more from the region. Absolutely. She was always very encouraging of us seeking out our heritage, but she couldn't teach us Arabic. So you came back and then you incorporated or you, you changed your, your degree. So I said to my Latin professor, listen, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to learn Arabic. I'm going to take evening classes. He said, don't do that. That's silly. He said, you should change your degree. There's this course called Classics in Arabic. It's for people who want to study the transmission and preservation of classical texts in the Arab world in late antiquity and the, and the, uh, the Dark Ages. As I'm sure you know, you know much of, of especially Greek literature was lost, but the Arabs preserved and translated them, especially medical texts, especially scientific and philosophical, you know, Flaton, Socrates, you know, these were famous people to the Arabs, Plato and Socrates. So that's a fascinating part of, classic, of classics. And so for the very odd person who wants to study that as their degree or PhD, um, there was this degree that you could do classics with Arabic. He said, why don't you switch to that? Then you can learn Arabic. So I learned Arabic like I learned Latin and Greek in a, in a classical yeah. training yeah. with no idea that actually this is to use as a language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and that was fascinating to me because obviously I was a classicist. I was someone who en enjoyed ancient history, but it was also that part that allowed me then to start um, in integrating into my own culture. Exactly. And foundational for whatever you wanted to do next. I would perhaps uh, venture to say that this is perhaps your first major pivot in life. It was a major pivot. And one of the things that, you know, and of course, these pivot points happen when something that's going on in your life coincides with something that's going on outside. Absolutely. Um, in a powerful way. And what, what was happening was 
you know, when we went to Syria in 2002, my aunt and I, and I was 19, is the war was already brewing. And I came back, switched my degree. And the week that I started learning the Arabic alphabet was the week uh, that the bomb started dropping in, you know, in, in 2003 yep, in the yep, war yep. on Iraq, right? So, um, and my aunt, who was an architect in London and taking me to Syria, suddenly becomes a member of the government in Iraq. In Iraq. My, her brother, my uncle, who stayed in Baghdad, became a member of the government. So suddenly you think, well, this is more than just a language learning exercise. What, have, what am I going to give? And you're of a certain age, you know, you're 19, 20, trying to figure out what you're going to do. I also think that you, you found yourself in a moment in time where after Iraq being stagnant for so many decades, it was suddenly erupting. And, and your, your awakening of your, you know, your Arab identity and your discovery of the language all coincided to, at the same time. And it must have been extremely exciting to, to you know, want to be part of that. After you graduated, you decided that you wanted to be back in the region or you wanted to be in the region. Yeah, so, so you know, after getting my degree with my very shaky Abbasid Arabic, <laughs> um, I experimented with, with uh, journalism, you know, writing about Iraq and Kuwait, um, which was good experience and carrying on learning. I, I hung out with as many Iraqis as I could. And whenever they spoke, I took out a notebook and wrote down the work. Because obviously with my classical Arabic, I had no idea what they were talking about at first. And so I had to learn the dialect yeah, and what is that course. what is that word? And where was that, Hassan? Was that in Iraq itself? No, well for, for a year in London. Of course right. so London full of Iraqis. Yeah. Um, and then I went to Harvard to do a master's in Middle East studies and uh, you know hung out with the Iraqi students who had been given scholarships by the Americans and were desperately trying to find out find ways of not going back to Iraq because they were meant to be sent back there. So experimented with journalism, academia, you know, doing a master's. Do you do a PhD, yeah. become an academic? And also did an internship at the UN. I did that as well, but way before did you. you. <laughs> really fun experience. It is. But it I is really fun. That journalism wasn't going to save Iraq because you yeah. either write in Arabic in the Middle East and you're, uh, it's very difficult yes. to say what you mean. Yes. Or you write in the UK or America. And the only logic of this is you should do something. You're, you're basically urging the Americans, the Brits, to take action. And I didn't think that was going to save Iraq. Certainly hadn't worked last time. So not journalism. Academia wasn't going to save Iraq. Very nice pastime for the diaspora intellectuals who want to, you know, who, who have a sense of, of longing for their own country and want to debate and discuss, but not really changing the situation on the ground. More of a hobby, perhaps. Yeah. Well, a hobby and, and a very fascinating intellectual career, but not one that changes things directly on the ground. And all my respect to my friends who are professors of, of Middle East, but it's, you know, I was a young man and wanted to do things in the country. And the UN, I also decided was not saving Iraq on the country. I had a very mixed history with Iraq. Well, you know, uh, Hassan, that my aunt was part of the delegation, uh, the UN um when uh, the UN was asked by the US to go in, um, into, into Iraq in 2003 uh, with Sergio de Mello, as he was the, uh, the head of the mission. And she there. was killed in the bomb. Yes, and she was his chief of staff. Okay. And she, yeah, she gave her life, actually. Yeah, it was in 2003. It was the first of the really big yeah, um, bombs That's that right. began then. So that was very devastating for us, as you That's can imagine. Right. And as you can, as, as that bomb really exposed, which some people were shocked by because they didn't realize that the UN is this good thing, is that the UN did not have a good reputation in Iraq because they were held responsible by the yes. Iraqis for the sanctions. They were, but to be fair, they also were given a very shoddy mission and, and their role was not defined from the beginning. But, but that's people another discussion. People always blame the UN. <laughs> for the dysfunction of yeah. its member countries. It was the member countries who pushed Absolutely. for the sanctions, not the UN bureaucrats. Absolutely. But that is how the Iraqi story, UN sanctions, that's where they were. And then this is the UN building, and so we blow it up. So, so I ruled all of those out, and I said to myself, look, I need to move to the region. I need to pick a specialism that I will become expert in, uh, and I chose education. So I joined McKinsey in 2008, based in Dubai, and I spent five years working in Yemen, Pakistan, Saudi, and, uh, and Bahrain, uh, very little in Iraq because there weren't the projects. It was a war zone, really, still. 
um, but with a view to uh, then doing a lot of work in Iraq. And all of the work that I did at McKinsey was either education, advising a ministry of education on how to improve schools or um, economic development. So it was a really interesting set of experience of working with similar countries to Iraq, uh, where the Saudi in terms of oil wealth or Yemen in terms of the dysfunction, but uh, um, Iraq itself was still out of reach. Did you find it very frustrating? Um, there was a lot of learning. I think when you're in your 20s, you have, uh, uh, you know, a desire to also learn. And that was definitely the boxes were ticked. In some cases, it was impactful. Uh, there was another turning point, And that was that after all of this work and this, this, this planning, um, the secular nationalists uh, won the uh, 2010 election. And these were the kind of people who, A, knew me personally, and I was able to have that network, but also had a vision for the country that I could believe in. Uh, I immediately um, wrote a, a brief um, and sent it to the Ministry of Education about how I could you know, help. And of course, what happened is that the um, outside powers uh, got together to maintain the status quo. The prime minister did not change. Nouri al-Maliki continued to be prime minister and uh, I didn't have an opportunity. I was ready to quit my job yeah. and go and, and work in Iraq. Yeah. And, and that was a turning point when, you know, and followed by a couple of years later by the ISIS and Iraq actually splitting. You know, Iraq yeah. was not split in the end by the war or by the uh, political parties who, uh, some of whom wanted to divide it. It was split by the bloody... Uh, um, invasion, frankly, invasion slash kind of revolution or whatever you want to call it of ISIS, which de facto divided it into this caliphate in the middle with the Kurds in the north and the uh, and the government of Iraq, as it were, in the south. Um, and and this was a time when I said, you know what, maybe I am not going to be the person who fixes Iraq. Yeah. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it, first of all, it's, I think, very wise of you not to have continued down that path because it, it could have been just a black hole and you could have, you know, ricocheted from one thing to another, but not really making any progress in what you wanted, actually making concrete progress. This is the thing, Malak, I've always thought about where do I have an opportunity of actually really contributing something? And in 2003, when you say, I am an Iraqi who has been really blessed with a great education uh, at a time when most Iraqis haven't because of what the country's been through. Uh, I happen to be in a family where I do have relatives who are now in high positions of government, and that could be helpful from as a network. Wow, maybe a way I could be really impactful is in Iraq. Mm, in and I country. can help. Yeah, yeah. And this is a place I can actually, yeah. I have an opportunity. Where is your opportunity? Exactly. And what I yeah. realized is, as someone who wants to have an opportunity to do uh, important things and, uh, and, 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 and have positive impact, uh, Iraq is not that place necessarily, at least not, not yet. Um, you know, uh, the, my, my friends who have had that vision have not succeeded, unfortunately. I like getting to know our guests a bit more personally and learning about the books, movies and music that inspire and fascinate them. One of the elements that defines Hassan is his desire to connect to his Iraqi heritage. This comes across very clearly in his choice of Ilham al-Madfi's Baghdad as his musical selection. He uses traditional Iraqi music and more jazzy, modern, international influences to create something that's more 20th, 21st century, but with a clear, you know, sort of Iraqi flavor. And it's really got that kind of sadness It is, but it's got that sadness that's very uh, important in Iraqi, in traditional Iraqi music, the kind of maqam. So, uh, sorry, mawal, not maqam. It's got that kind of mawal, you know. So, um, so it goes, Muddi bisati wa mlai akwabi wa insil atab faqad nasaytu atabi. And it goes on, it says, It says, um, and, 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 and 
بغداد وجئتك كالسفينه متعبه اخفي جراحاتي وراء ثيابي so it's you know it's it's basically about returning to baghdad and saying um um you know one of the lines that i just said to you was um baghdad i came to you uh like a worn out ship hiding my um my wounds uh, under my clothes um and i and i swooped down like a bird um heading for its nest and the dawn um was the marriage was like a marriage of um minarets and uh domes so it's a it's a it's a it's a melancholy song which i think is the right pitch for me when i think about baghdad and probably most people so book i think must be have been quite difficult for you to choose so the book that's just a book i've chosen and again i've taken this as an invitation to tell me something that that you like rather than this is my absolute favorite i'm just finishing it off right now it's thomas piketty's latest book it's called capital and ideology um his pr- his most famous book is from 2013 called um capital in the 21st century and he was quite a big source of inspiration to me in how my views of economics and politics have changed over the last decade but also in writing my book piketty is probably the most famous uh, living economist or certainly one of one of them uh, french and his basic thesis is that capitalism in how it has been construed and uh over the last you know couple of hundred years is a system where inevitably wealth concentrates increasingly in a small uh, in a smaller number of hands so wealth as a proportion of um gdp keeps growing and keeps get, getting more and more concentrated and so inequality increases over time through capitalism and the only way that you can undo that is either through a series of catastrophic wars as happened in the first and second war, world war and or radical taxation uh to redistribute wealth as also happened in the wake of the first and second world wars can you argue hasan we're due for that sort of recalibration now uh you know we had the world war 1 world war 2 and we could could we look at the pandemic as being and the, the financial crisis to of war a decade ago and the financial crisis as our sort of our our third and fourth wars in a way if you're going to look at it from his perspective are these going to be the opportunities to redistribute recalibrate this this issue yeah i think he would argue that we're well overdue better to adapt and redistribute than having the catastrophic uh violence that kind of forcibly redistributes Mm-hmm. So that's what I found really fascinating and then the other one which is my cheat film is called the three body trilogy uh, a set of three books uh written by uh Si Xin Liu a Chinese author and it's pretty much the most famous or most successful science fiction written in China the th- the three body trilogy I find interesting because for me science fiction especially when it's the grand science fiction that involves aliens for example and earth is just one planet amongst others this idea of extraterrestrial life by definition this is a way we talk about human kind as one because once you start contrasting humans to aliens the differences between nations become immaterial but the narratives of globalization and the narratives of alien attack think of the movie independence day have been dominated by america as the most powerful country the one that produces the most books and films and so fascinating for me to read a very well written science fiction written from a chinese point of view so it is global there's the odd british person in america and the un because we're trying to get together against these aliens but it's actually through a very chinese lens and you know in the same way that they always talk about science fiction as the way to understand ourselves now not the future and aliens it's a it's a lens to understand our own society and so i found this as a fascinating lens to understand in a way china uh, it's also brilliantly researched and full of science real science but one of the things that's also interesting and i wanted to make a point of saying is that xi xin lu is known to have come out and basically been supportive of china in its uh, xinjiang po- policy 
right? Um, something that I would be against, you know. And so, you know, should I not read this book, this this book, because this guy has views not only different to my own but very distasteful to my own? I I would say no. You know, for me, the answer is to engage. So I've been engaging with this book, although I don't like the guy's political uh, views. You know, but, um, you it know, is a Hassan, fascinating trilogy. I'm really fascinated by what's happening in 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 this cancel culture um, dynamic now, where people who have op- opposing ideas. If the majority don't like them, they get cancelled. And so you've got these universities in the US and the UK mainly, where, you know, if, if, uh, if a group of students, they call it also deep platforming, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, you know, they've invited a, prof- a, a visiting professor from a, from a different university. And suddenly a couple of people on campus decide, no, his views are not what we want to hear. So he gets disinvited without yeah. even hearing what he has to say first. So this idea of, of, as you're saying, we need to have dialogue, we need to discuss, we need to share a different opposing views, is, is being eliminated from, another, from the next generation. And, you know, I've got teenage boys, and I really worry about that. Um, the, the fact that they're going to eventually, in a few years, be at university. What's that experience going to be like? You know, these are, these are really important questions that are... That are that are currently I, being I agree faced. With you. And I, I share a lot of the sympathy, a, a lot of sympathy in terms of uh, intellectual preferences with many of these people who are cancelling people. In other words, I find many of the people who are being cancelled odious in some way. But for me, that's Agreed. not the approach, right? It's, it's, Agreed. It's, it's not the approach at all. And I'll give you an example of how different to this I am um, is, uh, you know, Jacob rees Mogg. Um, uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's Absolutely. He's, con- he's known as the member of parliament for the 18th century. Um, uh, you know, he is very pro-Brexit as well and has said various things that I disagree with. And he's very offensive to a lot of people. And, and um, he's also written a book which, by all accounts, um, was poorly researched and poorly written, but certainly just anathema to the kind of thing that I would like. Um, And I saw that he was debating, uh, he was in a debate to publicize his book uh, against Tristram Hunt. And I thought, wonderful, I want to see uh, Hunt tear apart uh, Rhys Mogg. I want to be there and I want to ask a question to him in order to put him on the spot by asking him something that I would like to challenge him on. So I went along and I sat there and I am now a, a, an, an unproud owner of his book because you got one free with your ticket. <laughs> I didn't want to read the book, but and I yeah. did. I stood there at the end and I asked Mike a challenge yeah. question, say, Jacob rees Mogg, you know. So we should be able to challenge people. Um, yeah. I totally agree with you. I agree. Um, and so, you know, I think it's a real shame. Um, yeah. I hope I can bring up my son to, to think, think about challenging rather than yeah. cancelling people. We'll continue our chat with Hassan and the next phase of his journey with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation right after this short break. Welcome back. You're listening to What I Did Next and our conversation with Hassan El Demluji. All that you've done up to now or up until uh, your current role, you know, it's all connecting the dots like that speech by by Steve Jobs where he said he talks about failure and and where you know you think that you know you're, you 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 make these choices that are unconscious but they all do lead in the end to something and so you know your interest in education your work with McKinsey obviously has led you to where you are now so tell me a little bit about how you got involved with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and your current role now. Yeah, quite simply, I was uh, recruited um, to set up their Middle East team because of the experience that I had working with governments uh, and in development um, across the, um, the region. My journey since then as part of this global organization, which is aimed at eradicating extreme poverty everywhere. Of course, the Middle East region and Iraq will always remain important to me, but you know, and I've always deeply felt that I, I'm, I'm, I've thought of my career more and more uh, within this frame of all lives have equal value. All places are equally important. And so where can you have impact? 
Um, and so I, I am now deputy director for global policy and advocacy. I still oversee the Middle East region, also Pakistan, but also Japan and Korea. So what 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 has happened in terms of pivots is that I have moved to seeing myself as someone who is not tied to a country where I don't right now see a lot of impact opportunity, although I'd love to in the future, but sees um, the the world and especially um, uh, people who suffer injustice or poverty as the people I'm trying to help. And my book is really a pivot to talking at a global level. It's called uh, The Responsible Globalist. And it asks the question, how should we act now, tomorrow morning? What should we get up and do if we would like the world to move towards being better able to work together? You know, there's something really from my Arab uh, background in some of the way I've thought about it, because to many people in Europe or North America, nationalism is the enemy of globalism and nationalism is essentially a project to divide us. But what everyone in the Middle East knows is that nationalism can be an amazingly powerful force to unite people. And that actually, if you don't have a nation, you've got nothing. In Iraq, people are begging people to come together and believe in Iraq and believe in the nation. They're begging the Lebanese to come together and have a Lebanese nationalism. Lebanese nationalism is meant to be a unifying force, not a one that breaks us down. So the, the essential idea in my book is, if you want to look for a philosophy or an ideology that brings people together, that can be the basis of global unity, it's nationalism. But this needs to be a global nation, not 200 nationalisms, one for each country in the UN, but a, a global idea of the nation as mankind. Well, that's just it. I think I think people confuse the nation state with nationalism. I think nationalism as a term gets a bad rap, doesn't it? It's uh, equated with, you know, protectionism. And um, whereas the, when the concept of the nation state in, in, in politics and international relations has, you know, is as old as, as time and it's the basis of everything. It's a basis of globalization. It's a basis of everything. Well, it's not as old as time. It's as, it's as old as industrialization. It's a relatively modern idea. But when it's a, a king sitting on top of a state that he rules um, through, because, uh, through might of arms, that's not a nation state. A nation state is this idea that the boundaries of the state should be defined by that group of people who inherently belong together, who are equal under the law, equal as brothers who deserve to help each other and help from each other. And it is only with the nation state, not a state of other kinds, that you get redistribution and taxation, that you get a free health service, that you get democracy, the idea that we should all have a vote and participate. No, I agree. And I, I don't want to go too much into that because I'd, I'd want to focus a little bit more on you. But yeah. I do agree with you. I, I think in, in the Middle East, the question is a lot more contentious because obviously our nations, our borders are not necessarily uh, created by the people living in them. But that's another discussion, which I would really love to have with you. Um, I'd like to talk, if you don't mind, about uh, the, the, the actual work that the foundation is doing in the Middle East uh, and how uh, the foundation has been dealing with the pandemic uh, I, I'm sure you've come across a lot of the media reports. Um, uh, you know, the Middle East is um, the, the cradle of the conspiracy theory, as I'm sure you know. And the whole, um, uh, there were so many theories about Bill Gates and all of this completely outlandish, um, as far as I'm concerned, outlandish talk about um, his role in the pandemic. And I, I don't want to go into that because that's not what we're here for. But... It's just to point out that this is a region where information gets twisted and gets disseminated in these very strange ways. And I'd just like to hear from you what the foundation is actually doing in the region, because I know that you're doing quite a bit across the different governments. You know, the Gates Foundation is, is an organization that's really trying to be part of solving global problems. 
And you can't do that on your own. We spend about $5 billion a year, which is you know a lot for a single organization, but it's nothing compared to the size of, of the problems, uh, which are measured in their trillions. So uh, we always work with partners. So we, more than anything, work with um, countries that have uh, more money and resource, with organizations that have a bigger reach, in order to try and help them to fix the region, you know, rather than coming in as a, an American organization from outside saying, well, we're going to, you know, we know all the answers and we're going to fix it ourselves. So the single biggest you know, initiative we have in the region is called the Lives and Livelihoods Fund, something that I conceived of um, uh, along with colleagues seven years ago now. We put $100 million into it. Um, other country, Gulf countries have put another... 400, 350 million dollars into it. Um, and the Islamic Development Bank has put over a billion dollars of, of loan money in, and, and they manage it. And that fund, which is about $2 billion, is used across, uh, across the region to fund health, agriculture development, and basic infrastructure projects for the poorest countries. So th that, that gives you a sense of the kind of way that we want to work. We want to use our drop in the ocean to uh, catalyze more action, positive action um, from others. Um, and that's why these conspiracy theories are so silly, because the truth is we're not doing anything on our own. You know, any vaccines that we, that we may be responsible for, we've actually given money to other scientists who are also funded by others uh, who are sitting in universities that are well-known and well-managed. It, it's not Bill Gates off in a lab with a, with a crazy scientist. The fund that you're talking about is particularly interesting because, as you said, it's you're not working on your own. And what I find really promising about that is that you've have partnered with several people in the region, be them banks or, or, or governments. And so it's a problem that's being uh, solved by the region for the region as well and you're just partnering with them. You're one aspect of it. You're not the main focus of it. it it's, it's very important that, re, that the, the problems of the region get solved by the region, and, and, um, and it's, uh, it's the only way we're going to get out of our mess, to be honest. That's right, and there are big transfers of money that happen between the richer Gulf countries and the poorer countries already. There's a lot of aid from, from, from the richer Arab countries. They look to us um in some cases for expertise and some of the areas where we have that expertise that expertise is project design and management it is how do you actually eradicate a disease it is technical knowledge we look to them for um distribution and to operate. absolutely and reaching and reaching the people exactly reach license yeah, to yeah. operate and and so you were going to you were going to say about what's happened in the last year with regarding the pandemic. Well, the pandemic, you know, has changed everything for everyone. You know, um, uh, we've spent one point seven five billion dollars globally on 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 the pandemic, um, and you know, some of that has been in helping individual countries strengthen their response. Most of it has been somewhere between supporting efforts to rapid, ra rapidly develop the vaccines uh, and scale up manufacturing, and then distribute them. Um, but also we've put a lot of money into um, developing treatments, you know, cures, actual, not, not the vaccine, which prevents you from getting ill, but, but treatments for people who are sick uh, with COVID. You may have seen, you know, some of the first doses uh, arrive in the Middle East from what's called COVAX, uh, of which we're yes. one of the founding partners. Again, along with many others, because we always work in partnership. But from uh, early last year, you know, I've been working alongside um the uh, the Saudi G20 presidency because Saudi Arabia was the president of the G20 last yes. year, um, as well as you know many others to bring together a global coalition to say okay we have to solve vaccine um, uh, the vaccine issue at a global level. Um, a lot of people have harped on a lot about um, uh, vaccine nationalism and their rights to because this is a moment that we really have to work together a, a lot as a world. But what's important not to lose sight of is that this is also, as well as a time that countries have tried to look after themselves, it's also a time when there's been more uh, giving 
to global vaccination. There's been a, rap, a more rapid scale up, a, a faster uh, transition from the rich countries getting it to the poor countries getting it than we've ever had in the past. So the world has done better than ever before. It's still not good enough, um, but it's mm. been great to be part of those of those efforts to actually get people to realize that we're not safe until everyone's yeah. safe. Yeah, there was a really interesting piece in um, in the Atlantic uh, Monthly magazine about how um, the it hasn't all been bad in the pandemic, and one of the things they mention is the fact that well, just purely from the from the scientific point of view, you know, who would have thought that we could have created a vaccine in under a year? That um, that jump in scientific ability will have a ricochet positive effect on a lot of other diseases going down the line. We forget the advances we've made this past year. Exactly. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. We've made advances in the science and we've also made advances in the global collaboration to actually get things out there. Never before has a vaccine been delivered to Ghana within three months of it being used for the first Absolutely. time in rich countries. Absolutely. Before we wrap up, I wanted to ask Hassan the question I love asking all my guests. Who would they include in their fantasy dinner party? Hassan's choices reflect his keen intellect, bringing together an eclectic choice of historical figures around his hypothetical dinner table. So the first I picked was Thomas Cromwell. Um, I, you know, relatively recently read the Hilary Mantel um, books, and as well as there's a recent uh, serious uh, biography of him. And he's a fascinating guy because in England, in the history of English politics, he really marks that first generation of people who were self-made and who ran the country as bureaucrats rather than by right of birth. He caused a, a huge stir because he didn't sound posh. He wasn't from the right background. But he was a mate. He had incredible skills, but his rough and tumble background on the banks of the River Thames, not far from where I grew up, um, made him a really interesting person as well. You know, maybe a dangerous, slightly thuggish, but the the range of experiences he had from the low to the high um, and he could have a good laugh. So I thought he'd be good at dinner. He's really interesting because he's got, I always thought of him as a sort of a Machiavellian character a little bit. So he, his career overlaps with Machiavelli publishing The Prince. And so, yes, he's very much of the time of Machiavelli. Interesting. So that's number one. The second uh, is a, a Baghdadi uh, judge from the 9th century, 10th century, called uh, Tanuhi. And this guy was an intellectual, someone in the heart of you know, being a judge, the administrative uh, system as well, at the heart and at the high point of an incredible empire run out of Baghdad. Uh, at a time when, you know, the Baghdad was open to China and open to Spain. Um, and he would have been someone with just an amazing set of experience and literary real life, a bit like uh, Thomas Cromwell, both sides. Interesting. Fascinating. I, I've never heard of him. So this is I love hearing about people I don't know. This is wonderful. Yeah. Look up at Tanuki. Yeah. The third is Ovid, a writer at the heart and at the high point of another empire the empire in many ways that the Arabs inherited, or one of the empires, yeah, which is the Roman Empire. Um, he was a, a writer at the time of Augustus. And, you know, you could say much like our time, also like Tanuhi's time, his time was the height of sophistication and decadence at the center of a, uh, a, an, a flourishing of culture. Uh, you know, in all of these types of cases, you have a backlash of people who would actually rather get more serious and crack down on liberty. And Ovid was um, at the forefront of the um, people who wanted to have a bit more fun. So the Emperor Augustus and others were trying to get the Romans to be a lot more serious and not have extramarital affairs and so on. Ovid wrote the handbook on how to pick up women in first century BC Rome. Uh, as well as other things. It's rumored he even slept with Augustus's daughter, but for whatever reason, Carmen et Error, a song, which is the guide to picking up women, and an error. We never quite know what the error was. For those reasons, he was banished to uh, Bithynia. And how much he hated Bithynia and um, because he loved Rome, he couldn't survive outside the cosmopolitan capital, is for me a sign of why I'd get on with him, because I wouldn't want to be exiled. I would want to be in London or New York or some great capital. And yeah, that's who in Ovid the center was. of it all. The ultimate urbane and hilarious, very, very funny comedic uh, writer. 
So you're, you're, I, I wonder what they'd make of each other, your three guests that we have so far. It would be quite interesting. Yes. Are they, are they all historical figures? This is really fascinating. Um, they're all dead. I'm fascinated by history. And to be honest, the idea that I could yeah. bring people back from the dead, why not take that opportunity? Uh, because you can have dinner with, yeah. real pe- with living people anytime. The next one uh, is Hannah Arendt. She gave a lot to, uh, you know, I think the intellectual formation of, of the post-war period where we, people were looking back as they may do on this period, and they were looking back at that time, what happened to us? You know, what was that? You know, Nazism and the, the two world wars and, and, and totalitarianism. Her most famous book is the, uh, On the Origins of Totalitarianism. That's fascinating. I'm, I'm loving your list so far. The last one is Sylvia Pankhurst, uh, who I just found out about quite recently. Emmeline Pankhurst is very famous. Uh, she yeah. was one of the leaders of the uh, um, suffragette movement. Sylvia Pankhurst was her daughter, initially worked with her, estranged from her mother, and really went off on her own. You know, the suffragettes split into the kind of militant suffragettes who wanted, I mean, they, these days, especially if they were dark skinned, they'd be called terrorists, right? The ones who thought that violent was necessary in order to get, get their political ends met and the others that were more gradualist she was at the extreme end of the of the of the militant suffragettes um and and did some extraordinary acts uh including self uh harm in terms of um you know hunger strikes and all of these sorts of things uh was in jail a lot became a communist and actually spent the second half of her life not putting down the women's cause but much more thinking about labor uh, and 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 Marxism more more broadly. I'd want so, I want I'm trying to put together a collection of people who are both uh, going to be argumentative and 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 hold their own and debaters, but have a broad range of pieces to their life, and also frankly, who um, I, I like people with a bit of artistic side. So Sylvia Pankhurst was also a painter. It would, I think it would be the sort of dinner that would go on into the late hours for sure. Yeah. It's interesting, Hassan, really. It, for me, these sorts of questions are, are always, um, it's not about the superficial, you know, you're very much a product of, of the United Kingdom, but you also have your roots in the Middle East and, and your guests reflect that to a certain extent. So, so it's, it's a nice, um, it's a very interesting list. These people have all, you know, produce some stuff that I've read or read about that I find fascinating. Um, but yeah, one of the things about me is the, is a kind of um, slight distaste for celebrity for its own sake, which I see all around me. Thank you for being with us today. This episode of What I Did Next was brought to you by ANT Media with me, Malak Fuad, and is co-produced by Shirag Desai. Please remember to follow us on Instagram and Facebook for updates on the show. Just search for what I did next. I'd really appreciate it if you could leave us a review in your podcast player. This boosts the show's ratings and helps us reach potential new listeners. Please join us in two weeks time for our next episode. See you then.